this was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves, he's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody else, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reach my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Listening to The Confessionals, I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionalspodcast at gmail.com. That's theconfessionalspodcast at gmail.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the contact section, and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me. Just get a hold of me. And if you want some extra shows every week, on Thursdays, we release member-only episodes on the website. So if you want some extra shows every week, Go to theconfessionalspodcast.com and become a member today. Now, we got a great show coming up here for you. We have Jeff coming on, and Jeff had a Bigfoot experience right outside the Philadelphia area, not very far from where I live, and it kind of rocked his world where he had to face a new reality that he never thought he'd have to face. And then years down the road, his son, who didn't really believe him a whole lot, didn't really believe in Bigfoot, had his own experience in this area as well. And so it's a great show coming up here for you guys. But before we get into it, I want to let you guys know that I should have told you last week on the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com, on the homepage, you'll see a video interview featuring me through Cryptovania TV. They brought me out. It was a fun time with these guys, hanging out with them. We went out squatching after the interview, but the interview itself is about an hour and a half long, and they asked me some great questions that nobody's really ever asked me before. So if you guys want to listen to that and watch that, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com right after this show. So without any further delay, let's go. Okay, today we got Jeff on the show. Jeff, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing good, man. So uh, you emailed us a little while back and you had uh, a Bigfoot experience here in Pennsylvania. You actually have a few that you'd like to talk about. And uh, I'm always up to hearing people's stories about Bigfoot in Pennsylvania since uh, I'm in Pennsylvania as well. And actually, you're not too far from me. So, uh, But we'll keep my my exact location between you and I. So we won't <laughs> we won't tell the whole world. Uh, but yeah. if you could just kind of walk us into your first experience. I know it happened a while ago and stuff, but uh, it, it's very interesting. Well, it, it was a while ago, but I, you know, I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, this was back in 2002, and it happened in Lycoming County, Pennsylvania, on the west branch of the Susquehanna River. I was uh, going on a little, like over a couple, you know, like a weekend camping trip with a friend, and while there, uh, he was going to teach me how to flint nap, make arrowheads, you know, the mark. So, and we, and while there, we would uh, walk the fields at the bottom of the mountain. The, you know, they were, you know, freshly plowed fields, and we looked through those fields for arrowheads. I collect Indian artifacts. So that was the whole reason to go there. I was I was about to deploy with my National Guard unit, and he thought I needed some time off before we went to just have some fun and stop worrying about being deployed and getting all your finances in order and all that things that go along with that. So, uh, you know, that's that was the whole plan of going there. I was not a, a Bigfoot believer at the time or, you know, one of the researcher people or anything like that. It had nothing to do with Bigfoot. I'm a hunter, and uh, and I like to be in the outdoors a lot. And, you know, I've never, ever even thought about it before this happened. So um, 
anyway, the, the first day was very relaxed, and we I had a lesson, in, and then uh, it was great up until the moment when I put a inch long sliver of obsidian into the palm of my hand and cut myself pretty severely. So uh, that was the end of the lesson for the day. I I, uh, I, I should have had stitches, but he put a butterfly on it, and we, you know, decided that we'd walk these fields and look for some artifacts. And one of the it was uh, early summer, late spring, somewhere where the corn was uh, maybe knee high in one field and maybe uh, you know two three inches in the other field that we were looking at. So uh, you know we walked the fields and. I found a couple broken arrowheads, nothing special, and I was getting really bored. So I had looked at the topographical map, and I seen that there was a creek coming into the river just down from this campsite a little bit. And I thought, you know, let's walk up that creek. I'm really good at finding them along creek beds. I, uh, you know, I found hundreds of arrowheads that way. Uh, so he, he agreed to go up. He never did that before. And uh, he was he was just starting to collect arrowheads at the time, but he was really good at making them, really good. You know, he gets two hundred dollars a lesson for the, to teach you people how to do this. So it was interesting, and he was interested in the real artifacts. So we kind of hit it off, and up this valley we go in search of these artifacts. Now, not exactly sure how far. We were up the valley. From looking at the topographical map, I think he got he, he got tired. Maybe maybe a little less than a mile up the creek, he got tired, and it was really hot that day. It was probably like ninety degrees, and I had my cantina water with, and he probably didn't have anything. I'm not sure if he did or not, but I know he was getting dehydrated. And, he had enough. We weren't finding anything. I mean, not a chip, not a flake, nothing. And usually, you can you know you can you can find artifacts along any creek in Pennsylvania because the Indians, you know, used every good source of water. You know, that's that was where they camped close to them, and their hunting camps and their villages were down at the bottom. So we weren't finding anything, and he got tired of that, and he he said, "I want to go back to the camp and." and make something to eat and blah, blah, blah. So I said, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty determined that, to find something. I said, I want to get to the head of this creek because I know within 50 meters of every creek, you know, where the spring is, where it first comes out of the ground, there's always an artifact camp there. You know, there's always an Indian camp there, or you can always find artifacts at almost every spring in Pennsylvania. So I was determined to find the head, and I wasn't sure where it was because, you know, on a, on a topo map, it's not always accurate where the blue line starts and stops. And, you know, some a lot of times what it shows you on the map, the spring is actually, the head is actually a little further than what the blue line is. So I'm up, going up the valley, and uh, it just started getting so thick. He turned back, and I was alone, and it just started getting thicker and thicker and thicker with rhododendron. It, it, it eventually became like a prison where I was stepping over, through, under, over, trying to get at, through this stuff. Trying to stay on the creek bed became impossible. And I got to, you know, and I was hearing things at the time, but it just, you know, I just thought, you know, rode it off as deer. I hear deer kicking up every now and then. This is a good thicket. I might see a bear in here, you know, anything. But, it, you know, those things didn't really bother me because I hunted bear, I hunt deer, and I've seen them, you know, up close. You know, there was never, never really any concern. You know, they usually don't want you. They, they run away. And, uh, you know, there's no really reason to be afraid in the woods normally. So I'm driving on like I always do, you know, pushing on up the creek looking at every sandbar, trying to find an arrowhead, couldn't find anything. And eventually I started, you know, like I said, it was getting so thick, I, I, I was just becoming a struggle. And uh, this la the last sandbar I checked had a crushed aluminum can on, and I don't know if it was a beer can or soda can, I don't really remember anymore, but I thought, oh, geez, this creek must go all the way to the highway and go underneath it to have picked up that beer can because this was a pretty pristine area. It's pretty remote. So I'm thinking, 
and I could hear a highway way off in the distance. It sounded like it was maybe two miles away, but you can hear tractor trailers pretty far when you're in the mountains. So I thought, you know, I'm not prepared to go that far. I only have maybe half a canteen of water left and, and maybe one little snack in my in my little day pack. So I'm going to get out of this mess that I'm in, I'm, that I'm climbing through and struggling to get through this road at Denver. It's just a tangled mess. It was horrible. So I, I remember seeing on the, the topographical map that there was a, a logging road to my left up out of the up out of the creek area, you know, up where it uh, levels off a little. And uh, that's what I was going to do. I was going to make my left turn out of there, just go uphill until I got out of the thicket and up to that logging road. And I was going to go back down the mountain and, and go home. Well, I got up out of the, the creek area and I found the logging path and and right there, there was a, a little area where you could see when they blasted in the logging path many years ago that they pushed a little pile of dirt up. And I have found arrowheads in those piles before because usually when they're 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 making those roads, they usually uh, go over a nice flat and, and they camped on those nice flat areas. And subsequently, they push the arrowheads away with the dirt and they're in these piles. So I thought, okay, I'm going to check this pile out before I go back. and. I took off my pack and I'm digging through this pile and, you know, it, it was only, you know, you know, maybe two feet high piled up and I just dug through that quickly and, I, and there was nothing in it. No chips, no nothing. There was two little northern ringneck snakes in it and that was it. So I tried catching them. They got away. And that pissed me off. And I thought, you know, I, I've had enough. I'm not feeling all the greatest. I, you know, I was just, I don't know, I was just feeling uneasy and maybe it was dehydration. I don't know what it was, but I just didn't want to be there anymore. And I was thought, you know what, I, I'm, I'm ready to get out of this hill. So I put my pack on and I turned around and I took about two steps down the road. I was looking on the road because like, like I said, sometimes you see them on the surface after the ground's been eroded away or it's been, you know, pushed with a blade or whatever. And I'm looking, I took about two steps onto the road and and uh, I hear a noise in front of me, and I look up, and there this damn thing is. It's about maybe no more than 60 yards away, and it instantly turned to its right and started running. Well, I didn't get a real good look at it, you know, from the whole body, you know, from like the the waist up, because it was into that, it was probably laurel there. It was probably Mount Laurel. It was, it was into the Laurel really quick. I mean, this thing was so fast, you would not believe it. It was like a flash. But I did see it for about eight seconds running. And I could see the legs uh, under the Laurel because the deer had everything browsed off to about maybe five feet high, as high as they could reach. And from as high as they could reach down was clear, except for the, the stems and stuff. But above that was pretty thick with... Uh, with leaves and things, because it was, you know, stuff had leafed out by then in early summer. It was pretty green. So I just, I, at first I thought it was a bear. And as it, I, you know, I stood there, I froze, and as, as it was running, I, you know, I could focus on the legs, and I could see these two enormously muscular, huge, hair-covered legs. and. Uh, uh, they were stepping out really, really fast. And like I said, and I don't even know how to explain it. It it was almost as if time stood still for a little while. I uh, I froze, and uh, I swear a thousand thoughts went through my head in that couple seconds. And I... I, I don't know if I was going into shock from what I was seeing, but I, I felt like I was going to throw up. I, I I got really nauseous and scared. When this thing started, when this thing got through the mountain laurel and got into the tangled road of Denver, where I just came from, it you could hear the crashing and the snapping of the branches. It literally sounded like a bulldozer busting through the trees. I mean, it was so so loud. I think that's what frightened me the most was the sound of these things 
snapping and crashing. I just came up out of there. I know what that stuff's like. It's it's very flexible and hard to break. It's very uh, fibrous rhododendron or mountain laurel. Yeah, rhododendron down by the creek. The mountain laurel was up on the hill. But uh, so I hear this snapping and crashing, and that's when you know the fear really set in. I was just about ready to to, to soil my drawers. Uh, and this thing blasted through that rhododendron like nothing in seconds, like a freight train out of control. You know, it sounded like a train wreck. And it got down into that creek bed and immediately went up the other side of the mountain. It got steep right there on the other side. I can remember that on the topographical map that it was, uh, you know, I could, that's how I found where I was on the topographical map by the terrain features. And, you know, that's, that was part of my job in the army map reading and all that stuff. And I'm pretty good at it. So I found, you know, he went up that steep thing so fast. I couldn't believe it and was gone. Uh, and I'm still standing there frozen in my tracks and I'm starting to, the panic is really, and the dread is starting to overwhelm me. And I just thought, you know, the only way out of here is in the direction where that thing was just standing. I really don't want to run that direction, but I know any other direction I go is going to get me lost and get me further away than where I need to be. So, you know, uh, I'm getting all hair standing up on my arms thinking about this damn thing. Uh, So I, uh, I just, I, you know, I just panicked. And I just started running as fast as I could. And I ran right past where it was standing. And I, you know, I'd, I didn't even want to look. I didn't even want to look. I didn't want to see this thing. I wanted it to be a bear in the worst way. But I knew that it wasn't. And I knew it wasn't a man in a suit. Because a man in a suit can't run 35 miles an hour through the woods, busting through trees and like it was nothing. And I've seen bears run through the woods many times. You know, they run. They can run really fast. And they barely make a sound. They could have weaved in and out of that stuff like it was nothing to them. This thing didn't care. It just plowed through it. And and I'm standing there, I'm thinking, if this thing wants me, I'm dead. There's no way I could ever outrun whatever the hell that is, you know. At that time, I wasn't like a, uh, you know, a re- uh, I didn't really follow the Bigfoot story, so I wasn't all educated on the subject. I remember my dad took me to see the Patterson film back in the 60s when I was a little kid. And I think it aired with uh, Chariots of the Gods. And it was uh, like a, before the movie, the feature. It was like little shorts or whatever. And, you know, my dad was a game warden all my life. And we hunted all, since I was little. I was, old, you know, I've been hunting since I was old enough to carry a gun. And I don't remember Dad ever even talking about Bigfoot after that. I don't remember ever asking him about about it either. But, you know, like I said, I wasn't one of these people that run around the woods clacking sticks together and making whooping noises and all that stuff. You know, <laughs> uh, I was just uh, a regular guy out looking for arrowheads, and I seen this thing, and I, you know, and I and it just scared me. I always thought... I was a really brave guy. You know, I was an infantry soldier. I've been in the the military since 1986. Uh, I finally got my discharge in 2006. But uh, nothing during my military career. And believe me, I've done some, you know, pretty dangerous stuff and been in some hot, hot areas. You know, I got the hostile fire pay under my belt. I was never that scared overseas or anything. But this, I was not ready for. I was not prepared to deal with what I saw because I didn't believe it. And still today, I don't want to believe it because it ruined hunting for me completely. I, uh, you know, I, I really like hunting, but this thing is in the back of my mind every time I go out in the woods at night. And, it, you know, and a lot of people, you know, ridicule me for, for uh, believing in this thing. The few people that I've managed to tell, you know, you know, the the, 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 tinfoil hat. And it's like, look, it's all fun and games until you actually see something. I said, I didn't believe it either. But I'm telling you what I saw. 
And I said, you know, I'm, I'm at the point where I really don't care what if people believe me or not. I'm not there to convince anybody anything about anything. You know, I don't care. I just know what I saw personally, and I know how it affected me. I had bad dreams about it. It seemed like on the anniversary, close to the anniversary, that time of year, uh, late spring, early summer, I'll have a bad dream about uh, one of these these giant things, whatever the hell they are. All right, well, speaking of bad dreams, it's a nightmare to have a bad night's of sleep. You know what I'm talking about. When you're driving down the road, going to work, and everything seems great because you slept like crap the night before. I know when I'm driving down the highway and I slept great, the sky seems bluer, the birds are chirping this beautiful, wonderful Cinderella melody. It's amazing. You know what? Sometimes when you have a bad night's sleep, it's not your fault, it's not your body's fault, but actually maybe it's your mattress's fault. Now, if you're struggling to get a good night's sleep, you got to try Purple Mattresses. Purple Mattresses will probably feel different than anything you've ever experienced because it uses this brand new material that was developed by an actual rocket scientist. It was not like any memory foam I'm used to. The purple material feels very unique because it's both firm and soft at the same time. So it keeps everything supported while still feeling really comfortable. Plus, it's breathable, so it sleeps really cool. Now, right now, you can have a 100-night risk-free trial. If you're not fully satisfied, you can return your mattress for a full refund, free shipping, and returns. And it's also backed by a 10-year warranty. I'm telling you, you're going to love Purple. And right now, my listeners will get a free Purple pillow with the purchase of any mattress. That's in addition to the great free gifts they're offering site-wide. Just text CONFESS to 84888. The only way you get this pillow is to text CONFESS to 84888. That's C-O-N-F-E-S-S to 84888. 888 and messages and data rates may apply now let's get back to the show jeff i know that you said you were having these bad dreams but let's rewind a little bit what happened once you ran to safety did you tell anyone i didn't say anything when i finally ran down the mountain i was running so damn fast i didn't even know i could run that fast i was i think 42 at the time and i wasn't in the greatest of shape but i wasn't you know, I was still able to pass my physical fitness tests in the military, and I was on a detail guarding the nuclear power plant in Limerick at the time. You know, I'm carrying a full combat load at work and a fully automatic machine gun. You know, I'm, they don't just give 210 rounds of live ammo and a machine gun to just anybody, and right. they're certainly not going to let me do it if I tell anybody about what I just saw. You know, so... When I finally ran down the mountain, I was I, I, somehow I gained my composure because I knew if I kept running as fast as I would, I was going to fall and I'd probably break something and and maybe not be able to get out of there on my own power. But I, you know, so I'm thinking you got to slow down, you got to slow down. You're going to fall these rocks. I'm jumping over logs. I'm going like a damn deer through the through the forest as fast as I could. So. I did manage to gain my composure and slow down a little bit, and then eventually I I just slowed it down to a nice little jog where I was able to start thinking clearly again and and regain my composure and get out of this panic mode that I was in. So I but I did run all the way down to the river. I didn't stop for a second. I didn't look back one time. Uh, I uh, you know like I said, <laughs> it's literally. Yeah, it literally scared the, the you know the crap out of me, and uh, I got down to the to the river, and my buddy asked me if I found anything. And I just looked at him like uh, I, was, uh, I didn't want to talk about it. Uh, and he's going, "No," I said, "No, I didn't find nothing, nothing up that valley." Uh, the Indians didn't use that for some reason, and uh, and if these things have been around as long as. The, the legends say they have, I can see why the Indians didn't use that valley because I found out from uh, uh, one of these researchers, I told him my story, and he came, instantly came back with a, a previous sighting from five years or earlier 
almost identical to mine at the exact same spot. And that just blew me away. I was like, oh my God, because I never made a formal report on it to one of these websites or wherever. They, you know, I kept this to myself because I had a job where I had to carry a firearm and I didn't want to jeopardize that. My military career, you know, I wanted to get promotions. You start talking like that in public, my God, you'll never get promoted. They'll take your damn weapon away from you and they'll put you in a rubber room. So I pretty much kept it to myself for a long time. But I'm retired now. Now I'm 57 years old. Um, you know, I told my kids about this thing, and they said you should tell your story, Dad, before you, you pass on or, or something would happen to you. You know, people need to hear this. And I'm thinking it took me a long time before I was considering it. And then uh, when I, uh, you know, I, I I seen a newspaper article. A online article from somewhere out in western Pennsylvania about a Bigfoot sighting out there. And people were leaving the, the usual comments, you know, the, you know, the, you know, your crazy type of comments and all that stuff and mocking the subject. And I made the mistake of leaving a comment. I said, yeah, it's all fun and games until you have one 60 yards in front of you. Well, that started a rash of contacts. I probably should have never said anything on social media because a bunch of people were, you know, trying to get in touch with me. And it just, it, you know, it just kind of pushed me further and further away from telling my story. Because, uh, you know, like I said, it's not my subject. It's not something I want to believe in. I certainly never want to see another one. Uh, not like that. Anyhow, it, it didn't, it didn't make any aggressive moves towards me it didn't growl i didn't smell anything all the all the typical things that you read and hear on some of these nonsense videos and stuff uh i didn't hear no wood knocks or whatever they call them <laughs> none of that but i seen this thing and i know it was real i know there's no way a man could move through the woods like that in a gorilla suit on a 90 degree day or any day for that matter so, uh, you know, I kept it pretty much to myself till recently. And, uh, you know, when I seen, uh, your, your, uh, your, uh, link on, on, uh, this researcher's site, I thought, well, maybe I should tell somebody about it. And, you know, maybe it'll help some of these guys that are interested in the subject. They asked me if I wanted to go back to that valley and show them where it was. I said, I never want to go back to that place again. This is no joke. This ain't funny. This ain't fun. It scared the living shit out of me. So, you know, it would take an army. I'd have to take one, my whole platoon with me up that valley before I'd want to actually go up there again. And I would never go unarmed. I never go into the woods without a firearm. But, you know, I, I, I carry a pistol when I go in the woods. I'm licensed to carry a firearm. But, you know, when, now that I think about it, this thing was big. Uh, my handgun would not stop that if it was charging me. It wouldn't stop a bear. You know, it might, they barely stop crackheads. You know, please shoot these guys that are all hopped up on meth. They put five, six rounds in them and they're still coming at them. Yeah. So I'm thinking, you know, there's no way I'm going to stop, you know, it's kind of pointless, but I, it makes me feel better. I feel a little safer. And, you know, this, this thing is, like I said, I, the, the legs were probably as long as I am tall. Now I'm, I'm, I'm a little guy. I'm only five, five, six, five, five, something like that. And these legs were every bit as tall as me because I was, you know, picturing the browsed off trees and how high that was. That was about, you know, up to my nose at least. And the rest of it, I can't tell how big the rest of it was. It, the, when I seen the rest of it, it happened so fast. And, you know, I, I don't even know if I really saw the face at all. I saw the side of the head. And if I did see the face, I'm, I totally you know, blanked it out of my memory because I probably didn't want to remember it if I did see it. Um, but I remember the head kind of reminded me of a... <sighs> you ever see a coconut still growing on the tree? Yeah. Where they're still inside that outer shell 
not the little ball that they sell at the grocery store, but the the, the whole thing, the, the big football shaped thing right. in the tree like that. And the, the top of the head was kind of like that, you know, kind of like like a coconut. That's how I can describe it. And the hair was relatively short on the head. But the rest of the body, I would say the hair was probably oh, no more than four inches long. It wasn't real, real long. And it wasn't real matted looking to me. It was, you know, uh, and it was a, a dark color. It could have been very dark brown, almost black. Um, and I would guess this thing had to weigh at least... I'm judging from bear and stuff, ex- experience with hunting bear and, and gutting bear, uh, what, a, what a big bear looks like. You know, I know what a 600-pound bear looks like. This thing was probably double that. It was probably 1,200 pounds, 1,100 pounds maybe, and over eight feet tall. I can't be sure because it's kind of hard to judge heights because I didn't stop to look at any branches where I, you know, I didn't do any comparisons or any of that stuff. I was getting the hell out of there as fast as I could. Uh, so I'm going to, it would had to be, it had to be probably close to eight feet or more, at least maybe, maybe more, maybe 10 foot. I don't know. Like I said, it just moved so fast. It just, it was, it was unbelievable how fast this thing picked up speed and in such a short amount of time. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much my story on that. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show to, to share your story and you, you gave such great detail on what you saw, man. It definitely sounds like it's something that really affected you and impacted you on a deep level. Uh, how long ago was this for you that you experienced this? This was in 2002. I remember the year because it was right before I was going to deploy overseas. And, uh, my buddy thought it'd be a good idea. My buddy thought it'd be a good idea since I wasn't going to see him for a year. You know, we were pretty tight, you know, hanging out and going looking for arrowheads. And I thought, uh, he goes, bright idea. Let's go on a camping trip. So you relax before, you know, cause, uh, things were happening at the power plant. We were getting some genuine threats there. And I just wanted to get off that detail because I wanted to deploy with my buddies you know, I was on state active duty guarding the power plant. That was Operation Noble Eagle. And then I found out that my, my home station in Kutztown, Pennsylvania, was about to deploy. So uh, I asked to be relieved of that detail, and I took a little break. And I was going to have a good time before I was gone for a year. Well, it, it was it was fun at first, but <laughs> the second day kind of was pretty bad. It definitely sounds like it's something that really affected you. And, uh, you know, it's interesting you you mentioned Kutztown, Pennsylvania, because that's actually where I grew up. And so, really? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I grew up in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. And then I moved to Hamburg uh, in two, no, in 1999. So, my father was a game warden in the Hamburg area. Really? Yeah. See, I have a good friend in the Charlottesville area who had a Bigfoot encounter in Gameland 110. Oh my, that's not far away at all. No, he he actually saw it on uh, Christmas Eve 2015. I think it was yeah, it was 2015, and that, that kind of launched him into the whole Bigfoot topic. He was up there hiking one one night, and uh, you know Christmas Eve, and he saw this uh, this white Bigfoot shoot across the the landscape and it it just shot him down this whole research rabbit hole and you know as many people do where they either dive into the topic full on or they kind of resist it kind of like you did where you didn't want to talk about it you just kind of let it go uh it seems like these creatures when people see them have uh, extreme effects on people either it's an extreme effect of we're extremely going to jump into research and dive into this, you know, head on, or we're extremely going to ignore it and pretend it never happened. That's what I did for a long time. I tried to forget about it and pretend it never happened because just the thought of that, seeing that again while I'm out hunting was ruining hunting for me. You know, I didn't want to, I used to have no problem walking up into the mountains at one o'clock in the morning for miles by myself in the dark. You know, to get to my remote spot before it got light. Now, forget it. 
I, I, I usually wait till it's just about getting light and try to creep in. And I'm out of the woods before it gets dark because this is in the back of my head all the time. I don't want to see this thing again. Yeah, it's understandable. Uh, so you, yeah. your son had an experience and this experience that he had, I'm assuming is more recently and it actually is a lot closer to where you live now and actually where I live. So if you could just share with us what your son experienced. Well, I, I'll try to give some uh, back up on the story a little bit to, to you know, so you can kind of piece this together. Um, you know, I, I live in a, a fairly remote area. We don't have any traffic lights or street lights or gas stations or anything in the township. It's it's uh, it's uh, wooded. It's mountainous. I, uh, people that live near rural mountains call them hills, but you know, people in Berks County call them mountains. So anyhow, it's very hilly and wooded and lots of water, and it's a protected area against development. Most of my neighbors have at least ten acres. Some of them have. 500 acres of forest undisturbed. It's gorgeous here. It's beautiful. The water's protected federally against, you know, people like Nestle. They tried to come in and buy land here to pump all the water out. Yeah. We we got rid of them. And so it's, it's a real pristine area. It's beautiful. I don't think it's been disturbed much since the 1700s when they came through here and did a lot of uh, charcoal burning for the, the forges. The iron forges in the 1700s had we had some iron forges down in the low Boxville area back then. So there's some charcoal hearths and stuff like that. But other than that, the the woods themselves are pretty much undisturbed. Some people log every so many years, but it's still you know undeveloped. And uh, you know uh, I have a fairly nice home and. Uh, you know, some, some beautiful scenery and I like to spend a lot of time outdoors. I have a big covered patio in the back and I sit out there at night and I make a fire in the yard. I have a big fire pit, you know, the typical redneck fire pit, ring us rocks out in the middle of the yard. And, you know, I like to sit on the patio and have a couple of yinglings and just listen to the Katie dids and the, the tree frogs and whatnot and the owls and the coyotes and all the good stuff of, you know, the country life. And uh, I guess this was about the last week, one of the last weeks in August when I, I was out there and I heard this sound echoing up the valley. This It was a, a, a whooping noise. It was like, whoop, whoop, whoop. And I'm thinking... Is that a coyote? That doesn't sound like a coyote. And then all of a sudden, on the other mountain, I hear this whoop, 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 whoop. It sounded like five or six of them whooping. The same sound, but like answering back. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking. For my first thought was these these nuts that go out whooping in the woods at night. You know, <laughs> the, the, the reason yeah. the people that like to chase these things down. And I'm thinking, oh my god, I got Bigfoot wackos right down the street from me, right? You know, I shouldn't call them wackos, but you know they're they're really really into it, and I'm not. I'm just I just I'm not I'm going to go out there and smack sticks together and whoop in the woods. So I heard this, I, and it was loud. And it was really loud. I mean, this was must have been maybe a mile down the valley that I heard this coming from. And you know, when I first heard it, I thought coyotes. But then when I listened to the replies, I'm thinking, no, I hunt coyotes. That's not coyotes. You know, I, I never heard that before. And then I, 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 you know, it intrigued me. So I contacted a researcher about it and I said, do they make noises? And he, and he sent me a link to something on YouTube. And what I listened to sounded like coyotes to me. And I'm thinking, well, that's not what I heard. And uh, so I never really said anything about it. And, you know, I thought, well, it, it, it kind of sounded like, like, uh, something you'd hear on some jungle documentary, you know, in the, in, in the Amazon rainforest or something. It was, it was like, like a primate sound. Like, I don't know, like, like orangutans or monkeys or something. It was weird. And I knew it wasn't coyotes. And, you know, at that time I was like, well, I was probably the nuts, you know, these people that are really into it. I shouldn't say nuts, but 
And that's what I thought, you know. It's like these big fur researchers out here hollering in the woods. That's probably what I heard, or some kids partying or something like that. And I kind of like blew it off and didn't think anything about it. So a couple days go by. I think it was maybe two days go by. And, uh, you know, I was on my ATV path. Behind my house, I have a lot of woods and I have logging roads that I take my side by side on. And, you know, we use it to hunt and pull firewood out of and whatnot. And there's the one spot in the road right before I turn back onto my property, right behind my one shed, where when I turn my wheels, it tills the ground up and, and like a rototiller. If you ever been on an ATV or a side by side, you know, when you turn the wheels in them things, they really tear up the sod. Yeah. You don't want to drive them on your lawn because it'll destroy it. So anyhow, the ground was real loose there. And the rest of the ground all around it was pretty packed, pretty hard, and, and you know, rocks on the surface. And, you know, you don't usually see any footprints or anything there like that. So I was walking by because I have a little bench there in the woods at the top of the mountain where I usually have my morning coffee before I start my day. I kind of like, you know, I'm retired now, and I like to ease into the morning. I don't like to jump right up and start working and doing whatever. And so anyhow, I'm going out to have my coffee, and I look down, and I see this big imprint in the ground. And I'm thinking, well, what the hell is that? And uh, I walked over to it, and I looked down at it, and I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, geez, it really looks like a human footprint, but it's awfully big. And I put my foot next to it, and I thought, that's about twice the size of my foot. And I'm, I'm looking at it, and it looks like I can see a heel, and I can see toes. And I'm like, no, this can't be. And I'm thinking right away somebody's trying to prank me or something like that. But I really haven't been talking about Bigfoot to anybody in the area or, you know, just online on the researchers. And so I went in, and I got my son, and I brought him out. I said, I want you to look at this. I'm not going to say anything. I want you to look at it, and I want, I want to know what you think when you see it. Well, he came out, and he looked at it, and his jaw dropped open. I said, does that look like a, a boot track to you? No. I said, what's it look like to you? He said, a barefoot human, but huge. I said, okay. I said, you see toes, right? Yes. You see a heel mark in the back? Yes. Okay, I'm going to go get my camera, and I'm going to get a tape measure, and I'm going to try and get a documentation. If I didn't have any plaster to do one of them casts that those guys do, but I don't think it would have turned out that great anyhow, because it wasn't a real clear track, but you could see what it was. So I, I measured it. It was about 16 inches long. It was about almost eight inches wide. And uh, I did find another track about four feet away, I measured it. I could only see the back half of it, the other side, the other foot. So the, the track I took a picture of was the right foot, and the half of the track was the left foot. But I only got from, like, the heel up to about the middle of the foot because the toe part was on solid ground again where it wasn't uh, softened, you know, tilled up by the, the tires. It was on rock. But the heel was in there, and you could see the the heel print. the The first track with the full foot was was uh, you know I tried to reproduce it with my muck boots. So I you know I put my muck boots on and I tried to make a track next to it, and he was like, "No, nope, that's not it. It's a lot smaller than that." And you can see the tread very clearly from my boots, and and then uh, I you know I I noticed in the heel of the, the track, there was a nut there that was pressed into the ground a little bit. And it, you could actually see where the, 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 the heel of the foot kind of wrapped around the nut, you know, and, and just made imprints on either side of it. You, I don't know how to describe it. Like, it was like a pad. You could see it pushed down on it. But, and then I tried putting my foot on it and I, I crushed the nut with the heel of my boot. So, and it left the track in the track. So I'm thinking, you know, this might actually be something. You know, I might, you know, my kid says it looks like a human footprint. It's big. And I don't know anybody with 16 inch feet. And uh, so 
I didn't think anything about it. All right, it's no secret I don't read a ton of books. Between producing audio, doing interviews, sitting down with the family, and driving a tractor trailer, I don't got a lot of time to sit down and read a good book. But I started feeling like I was missing out on a lot of information because I have a lot of people who reference me to certain books to read. And so I started thinking, you know what? I don't got time to sit down and read a book, but I got plenty of time to sit down and listen to an audiobook. And so that's when I turned to Audible, which is the world's largest selection of audiobooks and audio entertainment, including Audible originals. That's original content. And one of the books that I've been recommended to read, which I'm not going to read, but I will listen to on audiobook, is The Cover-Up at Roswell by Donald Schmidt. Now, Donald Schmidt actually goes into it a little bit differently, where he doesn't go into it where let's focus on the families, the witnesses, and their accounts of what happened, but rather, how did the government respond to this event through the military and actively suppress information? It's a very good book. It actually only lasts about seven hours to listen to, so I can knock it out in a day. If you guys are listening, you're not a truck driver, maybe you knock it out in a week, but either way, it's a great listen, and you should should definitely check it out on Audible. And now here's the fun part. You can start listening with a 30-day Audible trial. Choose one book and two Audible originals absolutely free. Visit audible.com slash confessionals or text confessionals to 500-500. That's 30 days of Audible on a free trial. You can choose one book and two Audible originals absolutely free. Just visit audible.com slash confessionals or text confessionals to 500-500. Now let's get back to the show with Jeff. Jeff, I know that you said that your son doesn't really believe in these things, but at what point did he become swayed to these things' actual existence? Right. My my son that is uh, my older son... He's a non-believer, and you know when I told him the story, you know he he just listened to it and probably laughed and never thought anything about it again. Well, he works nights at the local grocery store, and it takes him about a half an hour to get home. And uh, he, he gets done at midnight, and he was coming home about I think it was two nights after we I found the track. He's coming home. And he gets up onto the top of the mountain here, and he starts coming down through the woods, and he sees something in the middle of the road. Now, he told me, I, it, he goes, you know how in the headlights, you can see the road real clearly to a point, and then out ahead of your headlights where they're shining, you can still see a little bit. He said, that's where this thing was at first, and I didn't. Even I wasn't sure if I was even seeing anything at first. He said, I, I, can't, I can't, you know, he couldn't tell at first what it was. But then when his headlights got right on top of it and lit the whole thing up, it turned and bolted. And he said it was like a flash how fast it was. And at first he thought it was a person. And, you know, I'm, where we live, people aren't going to be standing out in the middle of the road at 1230 at night. Uh, it's, there's, like I said, it's remote and, uh, there's nothing around and there's no street lights and it's, you know, not time for people to be jogging. And I said, well, wh- wh- what was it? Was it a deer? And he didn't want to even talk about it at first because he was rattled. And, uh, I said, he goes, it was dark. He's being really vague. I said, well, was it, w- was it big? And he goes, yeah, it was big. I said, well, how big? Bigger than you. <laughs> and I said, well, that doesn't <laughs> tell me much, you know. I, I was, you know, I was like pulling teeth from a chick and trying to get answers out of this kid. And I kept drilling him, you know. I said, well, was it, you know, what color was it? It was dark. You know, and he was kind of getting irritated with me because I was asking him these questions. And I said, well, was it on two legs or four legs? It was on two legs. And I said, oh, now we're getting somewhere. It was on two legs, bigger than a person. Oh, yeah. And I said, was it covered with hair? He goes, I don't know. It was dark. And it, and when it ran, that I slammed on my brakes and because he was scared. When he realized it was something on two legs, that was, you know, and, and uh, I went through that area. And a lot of deer crossed the road right there. 
a lot of deer. I mean, we sometimes I've seen 80 deer in that one field at one time already. Remember that one year when we had that blizzard on Halloween? Well, the day before that storm, I seen 80 deer in that field. So that gives you an idea how much of a a population of deer there are in this area. It's ridiculous. Every night I have at least, you know, a dozen deer in my front yard. People spotlight them and shine them in my windows, and it drives you crazy because there's so many deer here. I wasn't seeing deer for weeks when that stuff was going on. Nothing. It was weird. You know, I, 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 I even threw apples out for them. Not one apple would disappear. That's unheard of here. You know, I have an apple tree. The deer usually come and take them. Nothing. They didn't touch them. Not a single deer in the area. And I just couldn't figure it out why. And then when he said he saw this thing, I'm thinking, that's a major crossing right there. It was standing right where the deer crossed the road. It was standing on the damn road, probably waiting for a deer. So he said it bolted. He slammed on his brakes, scared him pretty bad. He was shook up when he came home. He didn't really even want to talk about it, you know, and he wasn't a believer up until that point, but yeah, um, he's, 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 he's pretty convinced now. Yeah. I was going to ask you if he, if he's actually a believer now or not. So I guess he is. Well, I I think he's on the same page. I am. I, I, I don't really want to believe I was much happier not knowing. Yeah. But you don't have much of a choice now, huh? No, no. I, you know, like I said, I, I do my best to, to put it out of my head while I'm out hunting. I know from my my uh, first experience that this if this thing wanted to kill me, it surely could have, and it didn't. It wanted nothing to do with me. It didn't want me to see it. It didn't want me to, you know, I don't know if these things have been shot at by hunters or whatever, but it had a genuine need to get out of there as bad as I needed to get out of there. You know, I, I, we both couldn't run fast enough away from each other. Now, are you a little surprised that they are on this side of the state the way they seem to be? Uh, For the longest time, I didn't think that they were on this side of the state. And then when I looked into it more and more, I started finding more and more people claiming that they've seen it out here to the point now where you're just like, yeah, they're out here because not everybody's freaking lying. Yeah, I figure, you know, a lot of them YouTube videos and stuff are or hoaxes and stuff like that. I assume that right from the start. And, you know, I've been, you know, I, I know how to interrogate people and tell if they're lying. And, uh, you know, some people have tells and you, you can, you can judge people's body language, whether you, you think they're telling the truth or not. Some people, I believe a hundred percent, some people, not so much, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's an unusual subject. I, I, I've been thinking about it more and more lately, and my personal thought is, if these things are are uh, eating deer or or anything for that matter, if they're a, a physical being where they have to eat, if it's not some kind of supernatural thing that we don't understand, it, whatever it is, it's real, and if they have to eat, they're going to have to keep on the move. They're going to have to be very nomadic. They're not going to live in one place. They can't afford to be found out, hunted, tracked, or noticed. If they want to remain completely, you know, hidden from humans, they got to be on the move all the time. They can't stay in one place too long. And, you know, because they're going to use up all the game in that area. They're going to scare all the deer out of the area. You know, just their presence. You know, the you know the, the thing I noticed here is normally the deer are very tame in the early season, in, in the summer. They're not really afraid of you. They'll come right up in my yard while I'm grilling deer on the grill. They do it all the time. I have pictures, tons of pictures. I have a picture of five bucks standing 20 feet away from me under my apple tree while I'm grilling deer steaks. This year, if a deer saw you, it bolted instantly, even in the early season. 
That's natural during hunting season, but usually during the summer, they're not that skittish. And I noticed they were very afraid this year. For some reason, I don't understand. But if they, like I said, if they feed on deer, they're going to have to keep on the move and get into fresh areas all the time because, you know, you deplete the game. And if they're smart, like people say they are, they're not going to want to deplete the game. They're going to want to go to a fresh area, take a deer here, take a two deer here, keep moving, and remain unseen as much as possible. Now, every you know, I said something to my neighbor one time. That was a big mistake. Uh, and I said yeah, about what happened. I said, I think I saw something one time. I, in fact, I know I saw something. But, you know, he gave me the tin hat thing. And uh, he, he gave me the question, well, how come no one's ever found a dead one? I said, I, I can't answer that question, but how often do you see a dead bear? Have you ever come across a dead bear? Yeah. No. Well, we have thousands of bear in Pennsylvania. How, how many people see bear? Not a hell of a lot. I mean, c- compared to the number of people and compared to the number of bear, most never get to see them. You know, and even hunters, I don't know how many years I spent $20 on a bear license and didn't see anything but deer. Many, many years. And then yet they're there. They're everywhere. As I, I said to him the same thing, I said, look at monster buck. We have these enormous deer in this area, huge, huge racks. You very rarely ever see them, but they're there. And they hide in people's backyards and little tiny patches of woods, places that you would never even think that that deer would be. You know, I would I would think these things don't need thousands of acres to live. They can slip in and out of the little areas without being noticed in the dead of night. Apparently, they're very good at you know traveling in the night. They don't have to move in the daytime. I can't explain it, but if they're as smart as people think they are. It would be no problem for them. Yeah, and that's kind of how I feel too and stuff. I mean, I think that these things are, they have to be smart in order to remain so elusive. I mean, it's one of the, it's one of the things where, okay, we have bear in Pennsylvania, but a black bear is nowhere near the size of what these creatures are. And they, to me, they'd have to be at least intelligent to, on a certain level just to remain elusive, you know? Exactly. Smarter than the average bear. <laughs> you can say that again. You can say that again. Uh, but Jeff, man, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your stories, man. I, I really do. And the fact that you're so close to where I live and stuff is uh, its a little extra fascinating for me. Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it was close to home. Uh, I never thought I'd see or hear anything here. But either, uh, either like I got a bunch of people out here that, that are those people that bang sticks together and whoop in the woods and and somebody's making fake footprints but i doubt it this isn't the kind of place that you would want to run around at night people get shot out here for that you know it's 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 a rural area everybody has a gun in their house yeah i don't think they'd be prowling around in my backyard it was uh you know it's like i said no one lives real close to me it's not like the the suburbs it's country yeah, it definitely is. And I, I totally agree with you. Uh, before we get out of here, though, uh, you know, you, you saw this thing up close, your son saw it. Uh, what's your your thoughts on it, though, as far as, you know, what these things are? I mean, are they natural, just creatures that we haven't been able to pin down yet? I don't think they are, to be honest. It's just the feeling I get. Now, uh, that, that may be nothing, you know, my opinion, a, f- a gut feeling. I, I just have a feeling whatever these things are, it's far beyond our comprehension. The truth, whatever the truth is, you know, it, it's it's more bizarre than we could ever anticipate. You know, I tend to agree with you. I really do. I just, I just don't, you know, feel that anything that could remain this hidden, you know, I'm sure our government knows a whole lot more about it than we do. Oh, for sure. I mean, the government knows a lot more than they lead on about a lot of different topics. And I'm sure this is one of those topics that they kind of keep clamped down a little bit. But uh, yeah, I definitely think that these things are more than just, um, 
just a physical, you know, monster running around the woods. I used to, when I first started looking into the topic, I've never seen any uh, creatures, uh, you know, out of the ordinary in the woods. But um, when I first started looking into it, I was under the assumption and I just believed that these were just a giant, you know, gorilla running around the woods we haven't discovered yet. And the more I looked into it and the more stories I heard from different people, the more I had to start making sense of certain things that just didn't uh, relate logically to me. And uh, then I started, you know, looking into things more and more. And I started coming across different stories of people talking about these creatures doing things right in front of them that didn't seem natural. And you start hearing all these different stories and you start thinking, okay, so can, can all these people be lying? Uh, yeah, I guess theoretically, sure, they all could be lying. But I mean, what are the odds that you have this many people coming forward to share these stories of these creatures doing bizarre things like paranormal type things right in front of them? And these people are willing to put their their stories out there on the line, their reputation. And it's just at, at some point you start thinking, OK, well, maybe there's something a little more here than than what meets the eye. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know, a lot of these people that come forward, you know, they're not looking for fame and fortune. They uh, they don't really care if anyone believes them or not. You know, like, you know, p- people can tell, you know, hear my story and say I'm full of b- baloney and, you know, and I'll, I'll, I, I, I don't really care. I don't care what you believe or not. If that makes you feel good not knowing or not believing believing in anything that's that's fine and I'll, I'll will i'll respect that but you know i'm at the point in my life now where i really i really uh i have nothing to gain i have nothing to lose i hear that sir well thank you very much for coming on the show and sharing your experiences all right man, it was great talking with you Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok. I don't care how you share the show. But if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends because that is the best thing you can do to help support the show on a weekly basis. And until next week, friends, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Bye. Hey, thanks for watching The Confessionals on YouTube. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button, and hit the like button. That would be a great help to me. And if you want more of The Confessionals on a weekly basis, every Thursday I come out with a special show just for members on my website. So if you want to check that out, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And every Thursday, you'll get a new show, and you can binge on previous shows, which there's almost a 100 of them. So if you love the show, go ahead and check it out. But thank you very much for being here on YouTube and checking out the channel.